19, Romans chapter 8, verse 19, this is what the Word of God says. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Let's pray one more time. Father, we ask for Your help now as we look at Your Word, as we consider the truth of Scripture, as we consider the great plan of redemption and what You have in store for Your created order, for the consummation of all things through Jesus Christ, for the good of Your people. We pray, Lord, that You would cause us to draw from this passage of Scripture great hope and encouragement even as we consider what Paul is really urging us to understand, that our sufferings and trials and afflictions and whatever we may go through here in this world cannot be compared with the glory that will be revealed in the world to come because even creation itself is longing for that glorious consummation, that glorious end of all things and yet we know it's only the beginning, the beginning of a new creation. So we pray, help us, help us to put our mind, to set our mind on things above where Christ is seated. In His name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I've been looking forward to this section in Romans because it is such a vast section in Scripture in terms of what it covers. There's a sense in which we can say, that this passage right here in Romans 8, really all of Romans 8, but, but especially here as we consider creation, that this is the Apostle Paul taking us from Genesis to Revelation, from the creation of all things to the consummation of all things, from the absolute beginning to the absolute end. It is a remarkable passage of Scripture, and even more remarkable, brothers and sisters, as cosmic, as comprehensive as it is, as eschatological, as absolutely divine and exalted and profound as this text of Scripture is, maybe what's more remarkable is how practical Paul uses all of this theology to encourage believers who are in the midst of life's struggles and trials and sufferings and afflictions where the rubber really meets the road for the Christian life, not the theoretical aspect of our lives, not the abstract intellectualism of Christianity. It is that. But no, we're talking about our daily struggle with sin and suffering and how this theology is brought to bear on the most practical instances of the Christian life. And so I'm I'm really excited to look at this passage. Now, I want you to see that what Paul does here is really a stroke of theological and exegetical genius. Because what he has done is he's taken us from talking about the personal aspect of our hope to really now talking about the cosmic aspect of our hope. Talking about people and now talking about creation in, at large. And he does this by personifying the creation. There's three things that, uh, that, that really make up this metaphorical imagery that Paul wants to use for our instruction. Really, it's kind of an anthropomorphism of the created order. And that is that creation waits, creation hopes, and creation rejoices. And of course, it's metaphorical because as you look out at the trees and the sky and the rivers and the land, the mountains and such, well, here you're, we're in Texas, so it's like <laughs> it's flat land. You know, but I'm from Southern California where you look to the east, you see mountains. You look to the west, you see the ocean. And if you look far enough, you can see the desert and everything else. Whatever aspect of creation you like, I personally, me, I like mountain, mountain-esque kind of sceneries and things like that. I also like space and stars and planets and things. Everything testifies to the glory of God. All of creation is testifying to the glory of the Creator. But we are being told here in Romans chapter 8 explicitly that creation is manifesting these three characteristics of waiting, 
hoping and rejoicing. Waiting, hoping, and rejoicing. And so are we. It doesn't matter really what uh, season you find yourself in. Every Christian is in this stage. Every Christian is in this phase of life because we are in this eschatological time. A new creation has dawned in Jesus Christ, but its consummation is yet future. And that means that you and I are kind of caught in this tension where we long and we wait. This was brought home to us the other day, wasn't it? We were watching the uh, election debate or the debate, presidential debate, whatever. You, what can we call that now? <laughs> And we were reminded yet again that we live in a Disneyland kind of existence. But boy, what a reminder, guys, that we're living in a fallen world, fallen system, fallen politics, fallen governments, fallen politicians, and a fallen population as well. Everything around us speaks to us of how broken and fallen this world really is. And I pray for you, even as I pray for myself, that you do not drown that out as the world attempts to drown it out. That you do not try to look at this world in some sort of gleeful, optimistic way as if to mask or to hide the real corruption that is in the world because that corruption is designed to point you somewhere else to point you away from this world, to point you to the world to come, to point you away from the fallen systems of man, and to point you to the heavenly kingdom of Jesus Christ. And so we don't want to turn a blind eye to that. We don't want to play pretend in this life. We want to see the world as it is. Fallen, corrupt, and the, world that, the word that Paul is going to use today, futile. I mean, that word is a powerful word and it's kind of a simple word. It just means worthless. Wow. That's a powerful word that Paul uses to sum up what this creation has been subjected to. And so when we think about this personification of the created order, we are told that creation itself is waiting for this great and grand revelation of the sons of God. Right there, verse 19, we just gone... We just went from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We went from Genesis chapter 3 all the way to Revelation 21 and 22. Why? Because we are looking at the created order. And the created order was subjected to futility, was subjected to corruption at the fall of man. Namely, Genesis chapter 3. But he also speaks of the revealing of the sons of God. Which speaks of what? Well, look down at verse 23 real quick, just for Scripture's interpretation of that. He says, not only the creation, but we ourselves, what? Who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly. And he says, as we wait eagerly for what? For adoption as sons. But wait a minute, I thought back in verses 15 to 17, we, already, we were already adopted. But this is adoption. I told you this last time. But this is adoption that's like, We've been adopted, but just like any adopted child, they're going to be taken home one day, right? And so the same thing here. This is our adoption. When we are home, we are in God's house. We are in God's kingdom. We are in heaven. We are in the, we are in the consummation stage of our adoption. And so he says, we eagerly wait for the adoption and the redemption watch of our bodies. That is a reference to the resurrection. There's a lot of theology out there. There's a lot of eschatologies out there. There's a lot of perspectives out there. But brothers and sisters, there's one thing that I am uh, very, very certain of, and I guess if you poked me, pretty, pretty dogmatic about. Okay, Remember R.C. Sproul said every year he goes through the ten things he's absolutely certain about. And it's funny because he said one of them was monergistic regeneration. <laughs> it's like, how many people would put that on the list? Anyway, but, but I am certain that the resurrection is the end. <laughs> that when we reach the resurrection, when you have your glorified body, that's it, it's over. 
No more sin. No more death. No more enemies. No more fall. No more fallen people. No more governments. Fallen governments. Everything will be redeemed. Everything will be made new. We're in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. We are in a new creation where righteousness floods the world, floods the universe, floods the creation, floods heaven and earth. We've reached the consummation. And that's why Paul is giving us this kind of two-step program. It's either, it's either you're here now longing, waiting, looking forward to your hope, and hoping and rejoicing in that way, and then reaching that consummate stage of your faith. What this tells you and I, brothers and sisters, is that this, this hope of ours is bound to redemptive history. Don't miss this. This is, this is, this is telling us that our, that, that our hope is regulated by the plan of redemption, by the story of redemption itself. You are in a story. Oh, I hope you look at your life that way. You're in a big plan right now. <laughs> you know, I did college ministry for over 11 years at UNT here down the street where I must have spoken to, well, definitely on the, in the context of preaching, I spoke to sometimes three, four, five hundred kids at one time. It's the most amazing, some of the most amazing times of my life. My wife is dying to throw me back there. But anyway, uh, I spoke to a lot of college kids. And let me tell you that a, a consistent drumbeat coming from the youth today, certainly a few years ago, is that they are aimless. Sadly, they are hopeless. They are lost. They don't know where they came from. They don't know what they're doing here. And they don't know where they're going. They are lost. And it's because they have no storied framework to understand their lives. They understand their lives in light of evolution. <laughs> okay, they went from the goo to the zoo to you. Okay. Or they understand their lives in the context now. I mean, I can't tell you how many kids out there, these are people paying thousands of dollars to get a degree from all these liberal professors that are telling them you're basically living in a simulation. You're not even here. I mean, this is really what they're thinking. Okay? They've been listening to too much Elon Musk or something. Or watching The Matrix too much. But they literally don't believe reality is reality. That it really exists. This is all an illusion, of course, that is an old pagan cosmology. That's an old pagan worldview that says everything is an illusion. That's the Buddhist worldview of Maya. Everything is just appears to be here, but it's really not. The biblical worldview is completely different. We are in a story that begins with creation. It moves to the fall, then to redemption, and finally to consummation. Those four historical stages regulate our worldview. Creation, fall, redemption, consummation. And if you don't see your own life in light of that, you might get disillusioned in this world. You may get dizzy and lose your footing, especially when trials come in and begin to try to move you from your steadfastness, to try to move you from your stability, your faith, and your confidence in Jesus Christ you may think that you, like everyone else around you, is just sort of floating around in this aimless world, this sort of netherworld of sequential events that have no ultimate goal or purpose. Everything has a purpose for the Christian life. Everything. Uh, this is not Pastor Emilio saying this. Look down here at verse 28, the verse that you guys have all memorized. Remember? For those who, he says, for the, uh, and, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good. That's amazing. For those who are called according to His purpose. Everything. Even the, even the groaning and the suffering and the child pains that Paul is describing here work for your good and my good and the grand scheme and in the grand design of all of these things and the resurrection of Jesus Christ therefore and the resurrection of the believer is what changes all of that but creation also hopes look at verse 20 the creation was subjected to futility not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope now the exit Jesus here is a little tricky because you have to decide when it says in hope 
is that goes with the verse, the, the, the phrases that go before it or after it. Some say, well, it's kind of a transitional link between the passage. And I think that it should really go with the, the, what went prior, that he subjected it within the attending circumstance or the intending motive of hope. What does this mean? This means that creation was subjected to futility not by Adam, not by Adam and Eve, but this is a classic case of what's known as a divine passive in the Greek voice and, or in the Greek mood. And, and the, the divine passive means that God is the one that is to be credited for subjecting this creation to futility. And how did he do that? He did that by ordaining the fall. And so in that sense, the fall becomes collateral damage to the sin of man. Remember the story I was telling you about? We live in this great story. Creation, fall, redemption, consummation. And like any good story, there is drama. There's emotion. There is intensity. There is dramatic interest involved. And what could be more dramatic but to know that all of creation was basically a victim in the great story of mankind? That should cause us to pause there. I don't think anybody has given me more insight into this theology than uh, Meredith Klein, a theologian, Meredith Klein, who says that the world has become what he calls a global cemetery. That the creation was not meant for this. As you're looking at Romans chapter 8, this is one of the beautiful things about the Bible is all the Bible's connected. Amen? All Scripture goes together. The Reformers believed in this principle called the analogia fide, the analogy of the faith. And the analogy of the faith basically says that you prove Scripture by Scripture. Scripture proves Scripture. That's how it works. You interpret this passage by other Scriptures. And here's the deal. The background to Romans chapter 8 is Isaiah 24 to 27. Isaiah 24 to 27. And there, in those chapters in Isaiah, what's happening? But that the world is concealing the dead. The world is housing the dead. It doesn't want to, but it's being forced, as Meredith Klein says, it's being forced to operate upon the principle of this global cemetery, this principle that it becomes, as uh, Isaiah talks about in Isaiah 24, Isaiah 25, especially verses 6 through 8, it becomes like a shroud. In Isaiah 26, verses 19 and following, it becomes like a veil over the earth that houses the dead, that conceals the dead. It is total corruption. The world that you're seeing, and I don't know if, when was the last time you attended a, uh, a funeral? But I've done many funerals. I've done funerals for family members, and it never ceases to amaze me the gravity of this life. When that body is put under the earth, and we're all sitting there at, our, at the graveside of this person, we're watching that body being swallowed up by that veil, by that earth covering, by the dirt, by the soil. We are seeing something completely and totally unnatural. The world is telling us. Death is just part of life. How many times have you heard that? Just part of life. Some people even try to tell you that it's, a, it's just a beautiful part of life. Right? Okay? And now, with uh, this whole uh, assisted suicide fascination all over the world, I saw a woman in the UK who decided to commit suicide because she thought it was the greatest fashion statement that she could make. No lie. I mean, we are living in really perverse times, but... What does that show you is that people don't understand what death is. And they don't understand how to interpret death. It takes the biblical worldview to understand that creation is a victim of the fall. And that because of the fall of mankind, we now live in a world that is filled with futility. The creation, there's nothing wrong with it. The creation is beautiful, wonderful. Now, we don't get out in creation enough. You live in Texas, good luck getting out in this weather. But not too long ago, I was in Montana. Perfect weather. Uh, Trisha's aunt had uh, graciously bought me a 
uh, a fishing, uh, what's it called, like a fishing expedition. I went fly fishing, and it was just me and this skater kid from Huntington Beach, which I thought was bizarre. But anyway, he was rowing the boat, and he was a masterful, he was a masterful guide, okay? But I'm out there by myself with this kid. Of course, I'm evangelizing him the whole time. But anyway, I'm out there fly fishing, and the creation around me, it's just, I told my wife several times, I planted a church in the wrong state. I, I just did. You know, I should have been in Colorado or Montana or something like that. But anyway, I, I'm grateful. I don't question God's sovereignty, okay? But it just reminds us creation is beautiful, wonderful. It's good. It's very good. Isn't that what God said in Genesis? It is all very good. And then here comes the fall of man. But that fall did not happen apart from a deeper motive, a deeper purpose that you and I need to latch onto in our own lives. And that motive is hope. Hope. It wasn't just for sin's sake. That God subjected, that God ordained the fall. It was not just for the fall's sake, but for the sake of a great plan. And since we're thinking about Adam and the fall, especially if you subscribe to Reformed theology, this is what we call either the covenant of works. But what's behind the covenant of works? The covenant of works tells us that God created man in his image and put him within the context of a covenant gave him a mandate, gave him a commandment with a prohibition. And that prohibition, those, that, that, um, the, the, the sanctions of that covenant came with either blessing or cursing. Right? If you, if you obey, the implication is you eat of the tree of life and you advance to the new creation, to the Sabbath rest with God. You disobey, you die. Okay? But behind the covenant of works, Reformed theologians have identified a prior covenant, namely the covenant of redemption. This eternal, trinitarian covenant between the members of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, all coming together in full agreement, in total equal ultimacy, agreeing as to the plan, as to the means, as to the objects of redemption, and the goal of redemption. And the goal of redemption was to have a ultimate kingdom, the kingdom of the Son of God with His redeemed people. And so even as the fall came, Jonathan Edwards called it the Felix Culpa, the happy fall. Why would he say such a thing? Because we know that the fall, though tragic, though it subjected creation to the futility that we see all around us, in the end, because of the interest of redemption, the fall itself becomes but a stepping stone to the consummate plan of God of an eternal glorified kingdom through Jesus Christ. That's why I named our podcast Christ and Kingdom. Because that really is the whole story of the Bible. When everything is said and done, all there will be is Christ and Kingdom in the sense that we will see the kingdom of God fully revealed in Christ, God the Lamb, on the throne. And all of His people will be around that throne, worshiping Him for all eternity into ages unknown, into worlds unknown, in an infinite state of blessedness and communion with God. Isn't that wonderful? Creation is rejoicing in this hope. It's rejoicing. And it knows that right now it is forced to have to deal with sin. Turn in your Bibles just real quickly. Isaiah 24, beginning in verse 4. Just to show you one of the passages was John Murray, Meredith Klein, other expositors of the book of Romans that connect Romans 8 to this Asianic or Isaiah's background. The background in Isaiah. And they talk about this groaning of creation right here in Isaiah 24. Beginning in verse 4, this is what it says. Isaiah 24, verse 4. The earth mourns and withers. The world languishes and withers. The highest people of the earth languish. You see, it, it, that's a way of expressing that no one escapes the fall. Everyone is subject to futility. Right? 
The earth lies defiled. There's that corruption that Paul's talking about. The earth lies defiled under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed the laws, they violated the statutes, and maybe ultimately, they have broken the everlasting covenant, which is interesting. Uh, Meredith Klein translates that as the ancient covenant that goes back to Adam. And it's not the point here, but I think it is a reference to the covenant of works with Adam that led to the earth having to essentially put up with sinful man that lives upon it. Repeatedly throughout the Old Testament, the prophets warned the people of their sin that the earth would throw them up, would vomit them out because it was weary of having to endure. It's kind of like when I travel to Los Angeles and I look around at what they've done to the place. And I, because, you know, we're from there originally, my wife and I are from California, but it's like, what in the world have they done here? I feel like I'm looking around at all this. I went to a shepherd's conference, you know, MacArthur's conference. I drove down the street there in LA. I looked over, gas was $7.99 a gallon. I thought, how on earth are these people living out here? Okay, but it just seems like the crime, the filth, and everything that's going on, it's like, how this, this, how does this creation just not vomit everybody out? It's, it's, it's an, an expression that says that man's sin is basically intolerable. It's intolerable to creation. But ultimately, it's intolerable to man. Why? Look at, the, look at the problem with creation and what has happened. It says here, creation was subjected to futility. Got that. Because God subjected it in the hope of His great redemption. But look at verse 21. Creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. Man, guys, the language here is so powerful and vivid that Paul is using. The word that he uses here, corruption, is a remarkable term. Because if you just do the lexical work on that word, it, it, it speaks of corruption on all sorts of different levels. Corruption can mean something like moral depravity. Corruption can mean like something is thoroughly ruined, right? It's like when Paul says, you know, uh, if you sow to the flesh, you will reap a whirlwind of corruption, right? It is a total, uh, uh, just devastating effect of corruption. This corruption, however, in the final analysis, is spiritual. The corruption is death. But that means that, that death came through sin. Why do I want to focus on that? I want to focus on that, brothers and sisters, for this reason right here. Our problem is religious. It's interesting. I was watching Tucker Carlson, uh, I don't know, about a month ago. And I saw that he had Doug Wilson on. Not that I'm personally a fan of Doug Wilson, but it, it struck me curious that he had somebody like Doug Wilson on. And Doug Wilson said that he believes that the problems that America has are no longer fixable through just legislation and politics, that now America needs a spiritual revival. I wish I was in the room because I would have said or I would have added to that. No, the reality is, is that America's problems have always been in need of a spiritual revival. There has never been a time, not even one instance, of time where America's problems could be resolved legislatively or politically. That is to lose sight of the whole Christian worldview. <laughs> it doesn't matter what kind of politics you have in place. How do you legislate lust out of the human heart? How do you legislate greed or envy or strife or enmity out of the human heart? You can't. The only thing that can do that, not legislation, it's regeneration. And regeneration is something only God can give to us. One of the reasons I say all of this, honestly, is because if you and I lose sight of this story of redemption, creation, fall, redemption, consummation, if we're not careful, we will begin to redefine man's greatest problems and man's greatest solutions. This is the problem with the failed social gospel. Believing that we can simply change society, change its ethnic relations to one another, and achieve a more equity, equitous kind of life. 
a more righteous kind of world, right? A more just world. No, again, the social gospel cannot fix man's society, man's sin, and their ultimate dilemma, whether it's racism or corruption in politics, tyrannical oppression. That's easy for me to just throw that out there. You don't live in North Korea. You, know what I'm saying? you don't live in communist China. You don't live in Venezuela. If you did, that, that, would, that would be where your mind would focus in on. You, right now, we have, to some degree, we have the luxury of saying, yeah, those people over there. Okay? But some people are right in the heart of living under total tyranny in their culture and their government. But whether it's oppression, poverty, crime, disease, I'm simply wanting to remind us today, there is ultimately one great universal problem in this world, and it has one great universal solution, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is where the freedom of the glory of the children of God, it's all rooted in that good news that people can be liberated, all of creation can be liberated by what God has done through His Son, Jesus. Here in this context, what are we looking at? We're looking at the world under corruption, but it's also promising us this glorious future that's coming. One more time, look at verse 18. Let's go back. Look at verse 18. Where we all start, where it all started. I consider that the sufferings of this present time Man, that's you, that's me, that's right now, that's everything, that's every dilemma, every disease, every every weird, you know, uh, autoimmune issue that no doctor can figure out, every political situation, every Russia, Ukraine thing that's going on in the world, this whole present time, this present evil age that we are living in, whatever you are experiencing in the present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And therefore, what this is telling us is that there is a great redemptive reversal that is coming where everything that is corrupt now will be fixed. Everything will be liberated. Everything will be renewed. Everything will be replaced. The old will pass away. The new will come. Guess what? Revelation, Isaiah, you won't even remember the times of the past. I have to, guys, I preach to you guys with as much rigor because I need to be reminded of this that whatever problems you're going through here and now, in a very short while, okay, let's fast forward 100 years from today. I think we'll all be dead. Is that okay to say? Right? Say maybe the babies, right? But let's say within 100 years or less than now, this whole life, what it talks about, this present time, it will feel like a dream. It will feel like, man, what was that? When you're in eternity, this whole transient terrestrial existence that we're in right now, this will be a faint memory. And everything that was wrong with this world will be put right. I love it. Because it means that heaven will be a holy realm. No corruption, no impurity, no disease, no sin, nothing. Revelation chapter 22 is I'm going to read to you here in a moment. No curse. No curse. Revelation 21, verse 22 to 27. Corruption. This is nothing unclean will be there. And no one unclean. Because as John said, outside will be the dogs. We have a world of dogs today. Pagan dogs. Political dogs. Immoral dogs. That is just simply to say, we are unclean people. Remember Isaiah? He just got a glimpse of the glory realm and immediately caved in upon himself 
and his people. And he said, I am unclean. And I live in the midst of a people who are unclean. In other words, we don't deserve to be in that throne room. We've no right to be there. And yet, if God has taken His coals of, from His altar, His precious stones, if He has taken the heavenly and touched your lips with it through Jesus Christ, He has cleansed you. And He has fitted you precisely to live upon that throne. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. The one who overcomes, I will give to him the right to sit on my throne. This is our hope and this is the whole purpose of the story of redemption. I want to end today, I want to make sure, because sometimes I just kind of abandon ship and I, you know, I told myself, not today, I'm going to stick, I'm going to stick to my guns. Let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 22. Let's allow God to have the final word of what that future state will be like. We're going to read verses 1 through 5 and we'll pray. This is what Revelation says. Revelation 22, beginning in verse 1. This is what the Word of God says. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, or literally, there will be no curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And His servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and, not, and, and night will be no more. They will need no light of a lamp or the sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. Father, so easy for us, Monday through Sunday, to lose hope. But yet we come together on this Lord's Day to be reminded of our hope. Whatever we are each going through, I know Your Word is prophetic. I know that Your Word is powerful and dynamic. It's living, active. So I pray that you would speak hope to your people, whatever context they are in in this, in, in this life, in, in this season of life, or whatever they're dealing with. I pray for the people in our church that are dealing with various things, whether it's health, whether it's financial woes, whether it's domestic issues, problems at home, with kids, family, marriage, whatever. We pray, oh God, even our own bodies, just living in this fallen world, we're so reminded, we're so often reminded, we need something greater. We need something better. And we thank You for Jesus that He has brought what is better, what is great. He is the water of life. And in Him, we find life and life more abundantly. And so God, we pray, sustain us today, tomorrow, and for the rest of our lives. Sustain us through Jesus Christ. Sustain us as we do what He commands, that we would drink His blood, eat of His flesh, because apart from Him, we can do nothing. And so Lord, help us to depend on Him, to rely on Him. Help us to do away with all manner of self-reliance. Help us not to live and, and to reason according to our own wisdom of what we think is right. But help us to think the thoughts of God after Him. And to think according to the wisdom of God revealed in Scripture. Thank You for this glorious time together. And we pray that You would use us for Your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen.
Thank you.